we're not going to go through uh, the background on ourselves too much. Uh, the big thing about Russ and I, though, is we came from Windows backgrounds for the most part. Um, so a little bit different. Um, one of the main reasons I joined Stripe was because uh, I like the, the stack was a little bit different. It gave me some opportunity to get, uh, get some new tech on, get a new uh, tech infusion. And um, what was kind of interesting for me was oh, was Query. Um, I dabbled in it for a little bit. But working at Microsoft, it was uh, never going to happen, right? It was a Windows Defender shop. Um, but both Russ and I have uh, only used uh, OS Query for less than a year. So looking forward to networking with a lot of you folks here and trying to figure out uh, some of the best ways to use it. Uh, probably like a lot of people, when I first started using OS Query, uh, I quickly downloaded it and I installed it on my laptop. And I thought it was really cool. And I went select star from processes. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. Um, and then I quickly thought about it from a manager's perspective and was like, how am I going to get this data off here? How am I going to put rules on there? How am I going to configure it, storage, and all of these other kind of challenges that uh, seem to be uh, uh, that a lot of other companies or a lot of other technology had already figured out. Um, and then in addition, it, it's just a new, a new type of work stream. There's so many other data sources in a company like Ours, we've got these great engineering processes out there. How do I use the data from those endpoints and then correlate it effectively, given that really I just have this agent that, that pulls SQL queries? And then if you look at something more like um, a Linux environment or a Mac environment, which is our shop, uh, there's just not a lot of rule sets out there. Um, I talked to somebody a little bit earlier and we were talking about with a lot of these other EDR type of solutions, you get rules out of the box. And uh, with OS Query, you kind of have to build your own, um, especially in the Nix environments. There's just not a lot of stuff out there already that's customized. But I actually thought that was pretty useful because we can reduce the noise pretty quickly. And then, uh, you know, with a lot of the tools that are out there, uh, the last gentleman talked about all these tools that are deployed on the endpoints. Just there's this massive GUI problem. Uh, I went to RSA last year, unfortunately. and. Um, Walking around, every vendor out there has their own custom query language. They have KQL and IQL and JQL, and it's just, it's insane. And it's just a lot of challenge for um, security engineers to, to get their hand around. And of course, uh, OS Query is SQL based, which is great. And it's, uh, it also fits nicely into our other work stream because we have a lot of logs uh, and uh, you know, API information and such that we just put in SQL anyway natively uh, in AWS or other. So it's really good uh, from a workflow perspective for us. Uh, one of the challenges that we wanted to get rid of too is just the manual copy and paste between a lot of different systems, figuring a way to do correlation in an automated fashion, and then um, just centralize our alerts in general, and, and more so beyond just OS Query, but the other data sources that we cared about as well. So we're just gonna be talking about OS Query here, but it's just one portion of our overall security um, infrastructure. So like a good manager, when I got there, I built this nice framework, because you gotta have a framework, and uh, we are slowly trying to build towards this entire framework out here through a lot of automation. Uh, Stripe is super metrics heavy, so um, reliability layers are important to us, incorporating our threat intelligence and all that. All we're gonna be talking about here is the green section and a little bit of the detection side. And the green section is how we basically codified um, or de decided we were gonna codify our detection strategy and use it uh, not only for OS query, but extending it into other sources as well. Uh, and afterwards, if you wanna talk about, you know, just overall architectures and all that, uh, Russ and I will be here, half my team is here, it'd be great to network with you. So uh, initially we had three basic kind of goals that we are, or things that we were trying to solve for. Um, one of them that you run into a challenge with, with any time you have multiple agents and such on, on machines, is you almost always have to recreate the rule sets in those specialized environments, whether it's their custom query language or, uh, or just straight up uh, GUIs for some of these tools. That gets real old because after a while you, you really do know what you want in your environment, and it, regardless of whatever tool set you use, you can reuse those. So we're trying to come up with that way. We also have a fair bit of teams that use OS Query for a lot of uh, aspects beyond security. Uh, a good example would be, uh, we were just talking about uh, in the last presentation, uh, software management or configuration management. So our corporate en engineering team uses these for 
managing machines a little bit, trying to make sure that all the agents are there, that uh, JSS or JAMP is, is on those machines as well as those query, um, and then just understanding our software inventory. And then we wanted to come up with a centralized methodology that anybody at Stripe could use uh, to action detections and alerts that was independent of giving them access to all of our machines and our, our security tooling. Okay. And um, of course, the, uh, the skill set is, uh, is something that I'm uh, very uh, cognizant of too, is uh, being able to reduce the number of tools that people have to learn, but then still get great value out of them. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So here's our situation right now. Um, we've got two totally separate and different types of uh, OS query deployments. And actually, we had one prior to, and we deprecated it. But um, on our laptops, uh, we went to a, a lot of more of a remote architecture this year. And so we had some challenges with the way we were doing OS query before. And we did go to a, a commercial uh, OS query for our laptops. And, uh, but right now we manage all the machines, we manage all the agents with Chef, um, and it goes to a traditional uh, uh, TLS server. But we've centralized our query logic, which we'll talk a little bit about. On the server side, it's a totally different environment. It's very, um, we have a lot of ephemeral servers. They're, they're, most of them are very short-lived, less than a week or so. And so we deploy OS query via uh, Puppet out to the endpoints, and we pull all the data down into S3 and then forward it onto Splunk. Okay, uh, so our queries are a lot different on that environment. We don't really go for full process tree information or anything like that. Uh, but it all gets uh, forwarded into Splunk. So for an example, we, you know, this is something that we would have to deal with that would be uh, um, uh, a kind of a, a one-off type of uh, methodology, which is like going into, um, into Splunk and then looking for existing packs and then trying to do the analysis. And we just weren't uh, happy with that kind of flow. So our, design, our general design criteria then, of course, was to make some sort of codified extensible framework that we could not only push out to the environment, but we could do things like linting to it. Um, we wanted to keep it with Python and SQL as our main skill sets. Um, most security engineers know Python and SQL, so that's great. And um, it also uh, is really nice from an OS query perspective because if you're awesome in SQL, you can write your queries in SQL and then pull them down. If you're awesome in Python, you just do some you know, splat queries and pull them all down and then do it all in data frames. Works, works really nicely. And then, like I said, we're a big metrics shop, so how can we collect metrics as, uh, as uh, efficiently and full spectrum as possible? So, uh, um, you know, we're a financial company. We have a great data science team, and we started looking at data science. If anybody's been paying attention to the, the security blogs and such that are out there lately, most people are starting to talk about Jupyter Notebooks. It makes a ton of sense. Um, and I grew up in a world where if I was working with Russ or uh, Carl or anybody else out there, uh, we'd all write our own custom tools for our own workflows, keep them on our own machines, and then you know, we'd all get to be deep analysts over time. Um, that's not very efficient, and uh, you know, if we start looking at uh, something like these notebooks, it's a really good way for us to, um, to centralize our, not only our tool sets, but make some repeatability in the, um, in the way that we do our analysis, and we can pass it off to other teams who are interested in a specific topic, for example. And that's basically how we started doing our workflow. We really started with the notebooks um, to, uh, to get a lot of our uh, security information OS query being a, a primary central aspect of it, but other things like network, uh, network information, VPN logs, authentication, our SQL servers, and all of that. So one of the first things we did, though, is we wanted to focus on codifying libraries. So we built a bunch of libraries that basically abstracted uh, the API access for all of our, all of our engineers. So we wrote uh, libraries for, in, in the case of OS query, we wrote it for, for upticks. Um, for Splunk, we wrote Splunk ones, we wrote ones for Redshift and AWS, and we wrote many, many more for like our employee databases and all of that. And that was, uh, that was really central to, to making it easy for an analyst to just do like an import statement. So for an example, uh, this is one of the, of, of the ones we wrote for, uh, for upticks here. You can just, your query is just whatever your normal query would be in that particular language. And then your import statement is simply just for that particular library. I mean, pretty straightforward, traditional Python stuff, but it gets, it's a good way to, uh, to put everything in one location and it, uh, you don't have to worry about people connecting to different REST APIs and, and, and all of that. 
Uh, one of the things I think that we did was pretty novel, though, is we knew that we were going to use a lot of data science uh, libraries by default. So we, whatever data we pull back from any of our libraries, we automatically put it into data frames. So it's already in kind of the format you would use for uh, uh, you know, tabular-based analysis um, in, in Python. And it's been working great for us. Um, and like I said, there, there are some folks out there who've been doing this. So there's people blogging about it recently. You've probably seen it. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to see and talk to folks who've, who've done it through their entire workflow like we've done. Okay. So um, what are some of the advantages of doing it this way? Well, uh, there's a ton of API keys out there, right, for all of these different systems, whether they're security systems or whether they're production systems out there. And we really wanted to protect our API keys, and it wasn't great having them spattered all over your laptops and YAML files. So um, by having a centralized uh, notebook server, we were able to put all our API, API keys there and protect them all. We also have versioning control on our investigation tools. So not only like the last time that we maybe ran uh, kind of a baseline analysis, but also like when did we update it last and uh, you know, who was the responsible analyst for it so you can go to them and figure that out. Uh, peer reviews are central to the way we do our work now. People do peer reviews on investigations, but we kind of, we really formalized it more. You get some senior folks who can look over uh, some baseline analysis, you get some, uh, some uh, transfer of learning to, to other team members, and uh, that's been a, a good way to kind of extend the knowledge out to the rest of the team. And then uh, everybody has the ability to, uh, to do uh, this capability on the team. It's not like one individual is a repository for all this. Everybody knows the exact same methodology. You can extend it, you can add libraries onto it. And we've even uh, extended this out to a lot of other teams as well within Stripe. So, uh, of course, um, you know, we're essentially talking about OS Query, and Russ is going to go through a lot of examples here in a minute. But keep in mind that, uh, in, in my opinion, and a lot of others, OS Query is just a kind of a centralized place for like your, your server and your laptop data. But it's not, um, it's not great until you can extend it and correlate it. So we're right now in the process of building out our correlation engines. And these are just kind of some examples of some of the kind of the critical pieces that we are using now to do correlation. And, and some of those are in place, and some of them those are kind of in the works. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Russ so he can uh, walk us through some cool examples. And uh, then we'll open it up to questions. So notebooks are great. Um, but essentially what we're really wanting to do is implement, right, this whole process. We've heard this several times from people today. Um, good theories, good thought processes, their executions, whatever it may be. This is kind of the way we looked at this whole, like, how do you do continuous hunting? How do we really actually find bad guys? So from our end, as Matt alluded to, um, the uh, correlation engine is really kind of in the middle of being developed. But uh, the first two sections was this baseline analysis and detections, right? So the baseline is basically when you ask a question of our network. What is, what's it look like? What is that to us? And then from there, it kind of helps to refine the process. That baseline that we make helps to refine a process to say, this is what it looks like when it goes abnormal, right? And essentially, that's just a detection or signal generation. The, the correlation engine that we're in the middle of, of starting to build starts to kind of help us be able to stack other pieces to it versus a one-to-one -one ratio of these signals to alerts. So a baseline, though, is, again, it's a series of queries analysts <laughs> analysts can build or basically ask questions of our, of our network and say, like, what's it look like? I don't know. What's the average command line size? of SSH actually being used. Well, then we can start to enrich that data. And again, this is pulled from OS query from our angle. So we can say like, okay, so uh, of course we're very Unix heavy. In fact, all Unix shop. Um, so of course SSH is commonly used, you know, right, your, your, your standard DevOps kind of tooling as well as uh, uh, system, engine, uh, system administration toolkits. So uh, we can easily kind of say, hey, OS query, let's just go take all the SSH uh, sessions or uh, SSH processes for the past 24 hours, 30 days, whatever you want to kind of do, pull it down, and then let's kind of decorate it based upon maybe teams, people, um, what they do for Stripe, time zones, work hours, and let's just start looking at like what that means to us. So in this case, some of the libraries that we, we uh, uh, talked about was, uh, or that Matt talked about, was actually like some visualization ones. And so, you know, little things like you can see uh, most of our software engineers, right, operate command line sizes here, right, um, versus just kind of a general 
around our network. We just say, hey, our, our command line size for SSH sessions is roughly about you know, right, 50 to 100 bytes, but then we have these anomalies. So I mean, like just really, really easy things we can say like, hey, let's go make a detection for this. Now that we've got the baseline written, let's go make a detection. So what's that actually look like to us? Well, the requirements, as Matt kind of laid out earlier, pretty much laid us, laid us out into a Git repository, uh, YAML, and then Jenkins for the linting and deployment capabilities. So if our repository for all of our detections was loosely, loosely laid out on the MITRE attack framework, um, really mainly the attack phases, and we do account for some of the techniques, and you'll see that here in a second. But all of our detections basically fit inside of these directory, you know, the attack phases. We have extended it. If you look at, you can see here where we've got like grayware or we have malware, right? These, these have been some extensions of ours that we've just defined what that means to us, like grayware, things like TeamViewer. We don't want it in, in, our, in our environment, so we call it grayware. It's not quite malware, it's not quite, right? So we, we've kind of been able to just take that, the, the MITRE phases, right, and kind of extend it a little bit more for our, our uh, usage. But every um, detection made will actually fit into, into this. And every detection is actually now, again, it's a YAML file based upon this structure. So we have kind of a meta structure about every single detection. Regardless of whether it's OS query, like an OS query detection or something in Splunk or something in some other data source, doesn't really actually matter to us. The meta structure for every detection has these inside of it. Um, I alluded to the MITRE ID stuff, right? We do kind of account for some of that in our structure. That way we can easily kind of pull this through and say like, what's our coverage on MITRE if somebody ever asked us? I mean, I guess we could ask, add all the other like, diamond phase or the, um, oh, I don't remember, you right? There's, there's several other attack, you know, you know method or uh, 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 description uh, uh, pieces out there. But um, uh, the team, or I mean, the one big concept too out of this was we wanted to support multiple teams. So actually, uh, we do have the support in our detections that like some of our, what's called corporate, uh, corp eng or corporate engineering grade, um, or our IT organization can actually submit through our capability, like they can actually build a detection for their stuff and it will route the proper alerting to that team versus actually just us. So we hold the data source and we are the guys that have some of this stuff, but we don't necessarily have to be able to be the ones that write everything. Um, past that, you know, it's pretty much, pretty self-explanatory. We're gonna get into the engines here in a second, but that's what really starts to kind of pull, pull it out and say like, all right, regardless of what the detection is, right, here's the, the metadata we need about it, but then the engine stuff is where we can start to get specific. So an example rule, um, this is a rule of ours looking for um, a persistence mechanism of using the defaults command uh, on OSX to Trojan the uh, login hooks. So one of our detections. So again, the detection itself has, this is what the, the YAML rule looks, or yeah, the YAML file looks like for the rule. But then notice the engine piece down here is upticks. So this is again what tells some code in Jenkins on our end on the deployment side that says, hey, this rule is actually gonna go to that tool. And that's where it is. All right, so now this starts to move like, I don't have to go to 50 places to find out what we detect. Everything sits in this repository for us. So everything. And one of the things that we didn't actually cover is um, every YAML file inside of here actually sits in a directory structure. So there's the attack phase then the detection, the directory of the detection in a readme for it. And the readme for it is actually pretty much a mini run book, but customized for that individual detection, right? So it can kind of say, hey, on this defaults Trojan one, well, let's look for X, Y, and Z, or let's do these other pieces. Um, and you can really start to, again, customize how, you, how somebody should maybe respond to this, this signals generation. It kind of allows us to, to put some real customization in it, or we do have corresponding notebooks 
again, from the, the Jupyter side, right, we've got notebooks that say, hey, run this notebook, it'll actually extract most of that data for it. Somebody talked earlier about automation for incident response. Most of ours right now, you can pretty much hit a play on a, on a Jupyter notebook, and it'll extract most of the data, and you can, then it's just a pandas problem for querying the data for any anomalies. All right, so then the diversity technologies, this is how we decided to handle our, well, how do you handle all these data sources, right? Most of them are gonna be you know, kind of SQL based. There are some things that like, uh, um, uh, like Splunk, right, where it's time based and it's got their custom language, so we do have to kind of deal with some of those things. We're not, we're not, uh, uh, we, you know, we are still victim to some of the, the random query languages. Um, but in this case, right, we then just make a structure for the engine itself or a definition file for the engine itself and what's needed inside of there. So again, this is pretty much what's needed so that when this thing gets blessed in the PR process, it can actually just get deployed to the tool automatically. So we're not having to actually do this by hand and we can kind of account for what that looks like. So in this case, on the upticks, the OS query one, of course, um, there's, there's JavaScript or SQL. So the, the JavaScript or SQL for us, uh, if you're not familiar with the upticks platform, the JavaScript um, is, is streaming, right? This is where the scale piece really starts to come in. Um, for us, that's we want, I think, probably even like 90% of our rules are probably actually JavaScript rules. They're not SQL rules, they're JavaScript rules. We do the baseline and everything on it, but as that data comes in, it's, it's um, uh, passed through their JavaScript uh, engine. And from our end, we like the JavaScript mainly because these two facts right here. So when we started doing like average testing for alerts, it was 0.7 of a second from when it executed on a system to when we actually got notified via upticks, the upticks UI. It took about 1.6 seconds to actually make it from the upticks kind of world through a webhook and into our case management system. So from a time perspective, we can detect really, really, really early if we're doing JavaScript. Again, not everything supports JavaScript. That's where some of the SQL stuff does come in. So the engine type, you have to specify, right, JavaScript or SQL. The query, of course, itself. The version, this is important for uh, the tuning aspects around here, right? The alert fatigue. Um, if anybody or anybody on, on our team actually can change a rule, they can up, you know, they, they can tune it to whatever it needs to be, but that has to be kind of incremented, right? So that kind of lets us start to keep track of like, how noisy of a rule is this? Is this a pain? What do we need to do with this? You know, if this thing's been changed 10 times, is this really valid of a rule? Um, table, of course, again, this is uh, uh, the OS query table that it's actually gonna be working on. Uh, and then time, time is only based upon for our SQL-based queries. So example rule for, again, the, uh, uh, the default hook um, is, again, it's a JavaScript rule. We're looking for anything that has, right, it's, it's the path is user bin defaults and in the command line, it's write, com, apple, login, window, login hook. Right, and the rest of it's pretty kind of boilerplate-ish. Again, working on the process events table, and again, we usually see this. If this happens, it's it's generally like known bad. Like this is this is a you, we need to address this right now. So from the linting perspective, so now that we've kind of got the rule in place, we've got what it looks like, we've got kind of the, the overall capability, we wanted to really verify what it was that we were doing. Does the rule work? Is it good? Is it not good? Is it, uh, does it have all the fields that we want, right? Like when you start making hundreds of these, um, so we're 100% OSX shop on the laptop and nothing but Ubuntu on the server side. Um, it's not really a lot of good stuff out there for monitoring OSX. Let's just be honest with ourselves. So we kind of said like, hey, we're going to grow a bunch of these and we're into the into like the couple hundreds. When you start pumping out like hundreds of rules, like detection rules for uh, endpoints, you kind of get in the point of you're going to make a mistake. So this is where that linting piece comes in. We really, really wanted to have this as an element that said, let's remove a, a human problem inside of this. So... Um, all right, so we've got Jenkins actually doing like a, valid, a YAML validation, um, as well as we've set up just kind of like I said, overall um, 
checks via Jenkins inside of this, as well as like a peer review process. So again, GitHub really allows us to, or really GitHub, any a Git repository allows us to make this where anybody can can offer like tune, make a rule, tune a rule, whatever it may be. But then there is a PR process. Everything gets kind of run through that inside of this PR process. We haven't automated this part yet, but. Um, there's Uptix created a, a U event validator, and if you're not familiar with this at all, and you are working with with uh, Uptix in their JavaScript um, library, it's it's actually amazing. So essentially, we were getting to a point where we were really having problems with like, okay, I've got a rule, I've got it in SQL, I've made it from my baseline, right? Our ba our baseline allows us to say, hey, um, here it is in SQL. This is a good candidate. Let's go make this a, a detection. Problem though is that you go from SQL to JavaScript. How do we deal with that? What's that look like? How do you how do you really know that this rule works without actually like doing the process? And so uh, Uptix was really gracious with us and made this this U event validator where you actually will pass in the SQL query that it will use to hit the API, pull down the data, and then actually transform that data and run it through a JavaScript engine and throw your JavaScript rule at it. And so you can kind of see out of that, like this one, each one of ours, requires your validation rule. So this will hopefully be able to get us into uh, maybe uh, probably another round on, on uh, uh, iteration on, on the MVP for um, the, the uptick stuff, but maybe get this into a full automation build pipeline. Right now we require somebody to actually, you have to run it by hand. Here's the files and run it by hand, and um, it works. It validates the rules really well, but it's part of the PR process of like it's got to be in there, right? So we're really trying to remove any of the uh, the human aspect out of it. Yeah. Thanks, guys.